Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about taking science online with Bora Zivkovich of the Science Online 2011 Conference. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki, recorded on Thursday, October 14th, 2010. Taking Science Online. Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, this is Dr. Kiki Science Hour, episode 68, and in this episode, as usual, we're spending an entire hour diving into a single subject with a single expert, and this expert is uh, an expert in science and taking it into the online realm. Boris Zivkovich, he is the, uh, edit the chief editor and community manager of Scientific American Blogs, previously the community manager at the Public Library of Science website. And he additionally is the one of the founders and directors of the Science Online Conference, which has grown over the last several years from a, a very small conference on science in the online realm to a 400-person conference with people from all over the world who come to visit this uh, who come to visit the Research Triangle area of the United States over in uh, North Carolina. So, Bora, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Great to be here. Yeah, on such short notice as well, and I do appreciate that. Um, can you tell us what the impetus behind getting the Science Online Conference started was? Like, what, what initiated that? Uh, I can start with prehistory with uh, why triangle uh because uh, uh north carolina uh, has a lot of great universities unc in chapel hill is the first public university in the country then there's duke there's a huge land grant university at north carolina state university in raleigh a lot of other universities around the state uh, and in the first half of the 20th century all the people who got this wonderful education here had to leave elsewhere to find jobs. So the state of North Carolina decided to do something about it and, and uh, uh, dedicated a large tract of land in the triangle between Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill and built a research triangle park with such uh, wonderful companies like RTI, SAS, uh, IBM, Glaxo, Quintiles, and a lot of, you know, some of them are homegrown, born here, like Lulu.com and various uh, centers and uh, uh, institutes that do science. So there's uh, not just science, but also technology for 51 years now. And uh, this uh, marriage between science and technology is something that has really colored the triangle area and resulted in a lot of people who are related to both tech and science uh, starting to explore the internet, the web, and blogging a long time ago. There's a number of people in the area who have been blogging for 8, 10, 12 years. They had to hand code their blogs because the commercial software was not existing at the time when they started. So there's a long tradition here of good science and of uh, uh, and, uh, of kind of pioneering use of online technologies. So uh, my friend Anton Zeiker and I uh, thought that we should really try to help these two worlds get uh, uh, closer to each other, start talking a little bit better to each other, the tech world and the science world. We felt they were still not talking to each other very well. So we decided to uh, make a small local conference. We, we called it Triangle Science Blogging Conference. And uh, it was hosted uh, on the UNC campus. Uh, that was almost five years ago. And uh, we invited local bloggers, local uh, programmers, local scientists, students, 
uh, to uh, to come to the conference, and we had about 130 something people. But surprisingly, they came from several countries and from all around the United States. So it was a, immediately the first year. It was a surprise uh, how much it was uh, covered and how uh, much people had an interest in this. And as you said, over the the past years, it has grown to the point that now we are looking for a larger venue so we can accommodate maybe as many as 500 people. I mean, last year we had people from, I think, uh, nine countries, uh, including New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Poland, Serbia, uh, you know, the, from all around the world and all around the country, Canada, UK, of course. And uh, so it's become a, an international conference. And what is uh, really interesting about it is that it's not just three days in January when people come here and discuss uh, science and the web and uh, schmooze and network, uh, but it's something that lives on on blogs and especially on Twitter throughout the year. The, the hashtag on Twitter that we use, uh, SCIO11, uh, it has been in constant use throughout the year. So it's a living conference that, you know, people get together in person for three days, uh, but then continue discussion throughout the year online. And just bringing, trying to bring up some results on a, on the web for the uh, SCIO 11 hashtag to see what's to see what's up there. The the really interesting thing to me is that, like you said, there's a really multinational, international attendance at this conference. It just I really think speaks to the fact that blogging and science and uh, you know and not just blogging but um, video blogging podcasts, any pos possible way that you can bring science online, it doesn't stay in one location. It, it allows people from all over to become a part of it. Uh, yes, which is uh, wonderful. Science itself is global and doesn't really recognize borders. If it's discovered in Germany, the French people can know it. Uh, <laughs> so this new uh, online technology just makes it easier, makes it natural. Why, you know, why should uh, knowledge about the way the world works uh, belong to any particular country? Uh, so web is speeding up this exchange of ideas and exchange of information around the globe, and that's how it should be. Do you think, have you noticed any uh, dramatic differences in the people who attend or in the topics that are being discussed from the first year that the conference began five years ago to, say, last year's conference and now the topics that people are talking about uh, bringing into this year's conference? Is there anything major that's changed or shifted? I don't think it's major. Of course, every year has its own events uh, which color the, the, the kind of the key themes of, of the conference. So the first one was uh, really about introducing blogging to the science world. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the, the uh, year after that, uh, open access, still uh, some, you know, a fight to be fought. Uh, I think open access is something that's now here to win. Uh, so uh, it's shifted last year to uh, 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 very much towards the future of science journalism because journalism and media, uh, is, is, in general, is in big upheaval with you know newspapers closing, uh, news uh, newsrooms being cut to the bone, and especially science coverage being the first to go in many places from you know CNN to various newspapers. Uh, so. Last year was was really colored by uh, the state of science journalism and the science in the uh, in the mainstream media and how the web can uh, pitch in and uh, make it better. So we don't know yet what is going to be the theme, what is going to emerge as a theme theme of the next one. Uh, we have a planning wiki on uh, which people are putting their suggestions for topics and. Uh, things that are burning topics for them are going to uh, become sessions that uh, we are going to discuss in January. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the great aspects of, of your conference. It's kind of like an unconference where people come with their ideas. However, it, there are months of planning and pulling those ideas together. So people can, can actually put together some pretty, pretty interesting presentations and plan for it pretty well. Um, and and it seem and, and like you said, it seems it's it's a conference where the attendees 
make the schedule where the attendees decide on what is going to be the the topic of interest that they're going to want to discuss uh yes we uh we go by the the rule that uh you know these several hundred people know uh more and understand the world better than anton and i do uh so uh the, this is uh what what transfers into the way we are organizing the conference we uh do help the process along and we may inform some interesting people to us that the uh, conference exists that they are welcome and it would be very nice if they do a session there but uh, uh, we don't really invite and say okay you do this session under this title uh, uh, it is uh, much more open it is uh, uh, crowdsourced to, to a large degree uh, what topics and what sessions we try to make it balance as far as uh, you know variety of topics so all the attendees have you know uh, several sessions that they'll be interested in uh, that people who are watching us online either you know on video or over Twitter will find always you know at each time slot a session or two they they'll be interested in to uh, to follow uh, we are also very uh, concerned that uh, our session leaders, uh, we have a balance as far as age and gender and uh, background in science or technology. So it is not uh, uh, like your typical techie conference or a typical science conference where 90% of the people uh, are uh, looking like me, 40 white male. <laughs> uh, so right. we've been very uh, successful in uh, and working that kind of uh, kind of manipulating the process of crowdsourcing a little bit to get that uh, balance. And for instance, last year we had uh, it would be exactly half and half, but we had one extra woman as far as gender breakdown, for instance. So uh, that makes uh, the conference much more welcoming to everybody. People now know that this is a place where everybody's even, everybody's equal. There are no superstars and others or also rands. Everybody's superstar in their own domain and uh, everybody has something to teach and everybody has something to learn. And uh, so that, that makes the conference very, very pleasant, very comfortable for everybody. Everybody has something to contribute. Yeah. Do you think uh, that there are more uh, attendees now, I mean, you said that one of the important aspects of this is uh, bringing the science world and the tech world closer together, getting a little bit more collaboration. Have you seen uh, results of that effort from, from the conference or, or from what people have told you they've learned from the conference? Uh, yes, it's hard to quantify, but uh, there is uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, and interestingly not so much locally but internationally where people uh, learn something at, uh, from the conference and then take it home and uh, teach a class or give seminars or involve their colleagues uh, to to get them online to get them started on, on blogging or podcasting or uh, uh, things like that uh, collaborations have started people have uh, published scientific papers coming from those collaborations and maybe they first met at Science Online. Uh, so, yeah, things happen. I don't always even know of everything that's happened that maybe directly or indirectly uh, came from, you know, two people uh, sharing a meal at Science Online. What are some of the most, uh, most I, I think, impactful stories or uh, in, impactful results of the conference that you've, that you've noticed? results uh, that, that's hard to tell uh, every, every, everybody's happiness uh, at the end of the conference is the biggest result for me uh, satisfaction for Anton and, and myself that we uh, have done something right uh, that everybody is very excited uh, uh, during and after the conference and talks about it uh, I think uh, our conference has uh, in many ways legitimized uh, online world, especially blogging in some areas that were resistant, especially with some, uh, let's say, institutions and, uh, uh, and uh, scientific societies, uh, publishers of, of the old style uh, who, you know, sent their representatives or watched online and uh, 
decided because of that to uh, take a plunge online and uh, give it a try, uh, start a blog or uh, just uh, treat bloggers as equals uh, <laughs> if they didn't before. So uh, those are uh, lots of small uh, things. I can't point to like one big thing that happened uh, because of Science Online. I mean, the, the event itself is usually a place where some other, uh, some new uh, website or some new uh, uh, action is uh, first uh, shown to the world. For instance, Science Blogs Brazil was announced at Science Online. ResearchBlogging.org was uh, announced at Science Online. Uh, Akawiki. So things like that, uh, you know, people like to announce or unveil their sites at Science Online because they know that the, the a large number of people are going to watch it and, and uh, not just be there but watch it online and uh, uh, those are just the kind of audiences that people who are developing such uh, sites are most interested in. There's a question in the chat room. Ambrose is wondering if you can comment at all on the lack of R&D that's spreading beyond uh, Research Triangle Park. He says uh, or, that we here in Charlotte are totally disconnected from your excellent efforts. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? Uh, the, the, I do, we, because we want to work with, uh, with people in Charlotte. And uh, it kind of started very late uh, just before the last Science Online uh, through uh, really people associated with Charlotte Observer because just before uh, Science Online 2010, uh, Charlotte Observer and Raleigh News and Observer uh, restarted uh, a Monday Science Technology section. Uh, and so several people from Charlotte Observer were here. And so we are hoping and, and we've worked with them for uh, the past year that uh, they will be kind of our uh, uh, point people in Charlotte to try to gather Charlotte uh, scientists and Charlotte uh, uh, bloggers and writers and journalists to uh, uh, to bring them to science online and to connect the two communities a little better. I mean, we are just an hour away by train. We uh, really should work together uh, better, and I hope we can, that, that this is just starting to develop. Yeah, and I, I think this is, it's not just the, um, the question of, uh, you know, Research Triangle Park to Charlotte, which is an hour away. There's also the question of um, just connecting all sorts of different uh, centers for research and development around the globe. And the, at this point in time, it, it, is there really any central organization? Is there really any, uh, any group that's trying to bring information from center to center, from uh, individual to individual, aside from maybe just bloggers or you know, people who are just putting stuff out there? Is there anything organized? Uh, there isn't uh, anything organized for, for all of it, but uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, science technology parks like Research Triangle Park, they have their organization and uh, we had uh, a, a, a conference, their annual conference uh, here in Raleigh last year and uh, Research Triangle Park being uh, 51 years old is the uh, oldest research, uh, oldest uh, such park in the world and the largest in the country and is seen as the leader in, in this movement of, uh, uh, of uh, research parks uh, or science technology parks uh, and it's a, it's a place that other parks around the world are looking at uh, and so the first 50 years uh, were a great success but the world is changing with the, with the internet especially and so there's a lot of questions well why do we need brick and mortar places when we can all communicate online so this conference and the leadership of, of RTP uh, is uh, uh, something that is ushering uh, you know the next 50 years which is going to uh, be a little bit different but uh, Research Triangle Park is in the lead and there is a lot of communication between the global parks uh, how much for you know at this moment uh, this involves uh, organizations, uh, companies, in, uh, individuals, or uh, universities that are not directly associated with the parks. 
Uh, it's probably still a little loose, but hopefully it'll it'll get stronger because that's one of the the things that uh, um, you know RTP here is trying to do to integrate uh, all those uh, aspects of science R and D and communication uh, here, and then translate and uh, hopefully other uh, uh, other centers around the world will uh, learn from that experience and do the same. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, as I mean, we have the internet, which is an amazing resource for communication, and there's no reason for uh, disparate groups in, in varying locations to have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And if there are things that work, um, you know, those resources, how, is, there, is there, you know, some way to get those resources shared? Is there a model that we can learn from? Is there, um, you know, a, a central place that people can go to for, you know, R&D or even just really interesting science information, you know? Uh, that is true. Although, of course, the different geographies are going to have different uh, maybe requirements. They're going to have different environment, let's say political environment or economic environment or cultural environment, so they'll both have to uh, tweak it and uh, ad adapt it to their own circumstances, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if there is one single uh, kind of central place. Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it should be uh, a network of uh, independent organizations who are uh, tinkering and experimenting and learning from each other and each uh, adapting other people's solutions for their own circumstances. I don't know what is the best way to do it. Maybe it shouldn't be centralized. Right, right, right. Maybe centralization is not necessarily the best way to do it. Um, what got you interested in all of this online science stuff in the first place? I mean, you are, people refer to you as the science blog father. I mean, that's, that's quite a title. <laughs> uh, well, ask my parents. Uh, my, uh, my mother is, a, uh, is a, what is now called a connector. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was before the internet, so she did it in real life. And my father was a very social person and very beloved by everybody. And I think I picked something from uh, from both of them. Uh, I was in graduate school at NC State University in the Department of Zoology, which is now biology, because zoology and botany fused, uh, studying circadian rhythms uh, for 10 years. Loved it, but, you know, after 10 years, I uh, broke down. I hit the wall, and uh, at the same time got uh, very much involved in politics because that was 03 uh, so I was <laughs> thinking okay can we get a Democrat elected um, so uh, I started uh, 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 getting online uh, much more for politics than science I mean I was, I was doing my work I was starting to write my dissertation which I never finished uh, I was you know reading online uh, but you know I was at the university I had access to everything through the library uh, and it was not something I gave much thought to but I was discovering the world of uh, politics and political blogs uh, online after the 04 election uh, I was sick of politics we lost so what do I do <laughs> uh, and by that time I was already kind of out of grad school ABD no PhD uh, probably not interested in, in uh, actually working in science anymore. The finances for science were already going, you know, uh, going down into the cellar. Yeah. Uh, kind of the future uh, was, was not there, but I was very interested uh, by that time in online communication. But I decided that, uh, you know, everybody can bash push, uh, but I can uh, write about things that I have expertise on and most people do not and that is circadian rhythms that the stuff I was studying so I started another blog uh, and uh, uh, wrote a, a long post about uh, sleep patterns and circadian clocks in humans and overnight it got I don't know 30,000 and then another 30,000 hits from Boing Boing and Andrew Sullivan and, and all those and I realized hey you know obviously there's interest in this and people trust me because I put my name up there and said hey this is what I study uh, so t people took my word as a as a word of an expert and I decided mm -hmm. oh okay so there there's a there's a niche for me to fill uh, somebody with expertise in something that people are interested in, uh, sleep cycles and other uh, biological rhythms, people are interested in this. So I continued 
uh, writing about that. And about a year later, I got invited to join scienceblogs.com by uh, Seed Media Group. Uh, the the f uh, actually chronologically not the first, but the first big one that made it go, made a real big splash, and uh, a network that all the mainstream media started following because it was indexed in Google News, not just Google. And uh, so it became, for many people who are not, uh, you know, wonks, but, you know, let's say journalists, uh, to uh, a kind of one-stop shopping place to see what's happening in science. They would go to scienceblogs.com. So being on that platform uh, made, a, you know, all of us bloggers there very visible, uh, taught us how to be responsible bloggers even more than we we were before uh, kind of fact checking ourselves better and uh, uh, being very uh, careful about what we put out there because we saw uh, the, how many eyes are on us. But it was also right. a, a great visibility for each one of us individually and a lot of us uh, got things out of there, you know, book deals and uh, I got a job with uh, PLOS right in the comments of my blog post. Uh, which was titled, I want this job, and a copy and paste of their job description, uh, which is a nice way of getting a job, um, uh, which just shows that, uh, you know, that they are kind of cutting edge. They actually uh, go around science blogs and see who mentions them and then post in the comments, uh, you know, is uh, should we consider this to be a formal application? And, you know, next comment is mine, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's my application, we, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and uh, then we switched to, you know, email and phone and then I went there and interviewed and got a job. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, speaking gigs and uh, uh, a lot of people got uh, a lot out of it. And we got a stamp of approval by being uh, picked and chosen by hand by a media organization. Uh, so we were treated as media. Uh, although, you know, some of the bloggers say, well, I'm not a journalist. I'm not either. But uh, uh, once you're uh, in Google News and once uh, you are on a platform that mainstream media is using as your source as source of science news you are media wanted or not and you better behave that way right have you seen a lot of individuals um not behave that way i mean for the most part in terms of the the science bloggers that i read uh regularly they're all pretty well behaved they you know they they maybe step out of, step out on the opinionating <laughs> platform every once in a while but uh, yeah, we we all do. I mean, uh, it, it's very easy to to uh, click publish and then regret it in the morning. So we, we've all been there. But uh, you know, if if you're just focusing and you're in the world of science blogging, sometimes you get very irked by you know this blogger saying this or that. But you know, go out to some other blogospheres and see. <laughs> hey, science bloggers are actually quite well behaved in comparison with some other communities, uh, and we we tend to have uh, much better. Uh, uh, common threads as far as a lot of people who come to science blogs are interested in science to begin with and uh, often have some expertise, maybe they're scientists themselves. So often our common threads can be uh, quite enlightening and interesting and can get quite technical even sometimes uh, on some topics. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things I love about science blogs uh, is the fact that you can get uh, get news from people's labs right out of the people who work in those labs. The scientists who are doing research, they tell you about it sometimes. Or a uh, paper comes out and maybe the media treats it one way, but you can go to the science blogs and there's somebody who's broken down the paper, the scientific paper, point by point, and can tell you what's really happening and why the media is getting it wrong. So uh, that, that's one aspect of blogging that I just, I really appreciate. It's kind of the the fact checking for the media, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I think uh, you know that there's always a a, a lot of uh, you know fighting uh, bloggers versus journalists. I, I think this is actually a, a, a symbiotic uh, relationship that a lot of mainstream journalists have learned a lot from 
being criticized by the bloggers who are experts in the field uh, so they don't make uh, the same mistakes i think they, they've been uh, made better and uh, you know they're careful because they know they're watched by people who have pretty big megaphones themselves uh, okay. and actually have the expertise so uh, i think uh, you know uh, bloggers and journalists are, are kind of you know watching each other and learning from each other uh, how to write better and how to think better and uh, how to present science better and I think uh, we are all together better off because of that even if there are you know sometimes uh, uh, grumbles and grudges and nobody likes to be uh, criticized but you know you, you in internalize those criticisms and you don't make the same mistake next time even if you're angry today uh, you've learned something uh, but the other thing that you first mentioned is that a lot of science bloggers uh, write things that uh, reveal some of their personality and also you know they talk about life in you know what it means to be a scientist that uh, that's one of the biggest things that that science blogosphere has done and that is uh, humanized scientists uh, you know we are people like anybody else uh, we are right. not uh, uh, you know uh, anti-social or, or you know people with no social skills and no writing skills and no knowledge of humanities never read Shakespeare uh, never watched a movie uh, obviously we are interested in so many other things we have uh, all the uh, you know uh, good and bad sides that any human being has and just seeing that is uh, probably eye-opening for a lot of people that you know we're human and we're just like anybody else uh, science is our passion science is for uh, a lot of us a job not for me anymore but uh, uh, something related to science is uh, so uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's one of the best things the science blogosphere has done I've seen the, the science blogosphere really grow over the last several years. I think that it's just blossomed. From the time that I started paying attention to it, um, I, I started my blog back in 2005. Um, and in the last five years, I've seen so many new faces come in. I've seen um, just, just so many people getting involved in science blogging. What do you think has really promoted that trend? Do you have any ideas? The uh, earliest science blogs came out of uh, techie blogosphere. So those are uh, mostly math and computer science, occasionally a physics blog. There are just a few of them, and uh, uh, they're not uh, that well known. Then the uh, second group of science bloggers emerged out of political blogosphere like myself. And uh, a lot of what we were uh, writing about is uh, really pushback against creationism, a lot of uh, dissection of pseudoscientific claims, medical quackery. Uh, so the uh, whole second generation uh, has emerged in, you know, 03, 04, 05. And then uh, a big kind of precipitating moment was the foundation of scienceblogs.com by, by Seed Media. Suddenly there's a one-stop uh, shopping place uh, for a lot of uh, popular science bloggers right. uh, where uh, a lot of people saw science blogs for the first time and uh, a lot of them realized hey I can do that too and so they, they emerged kind of a third generation which is now counting in thousands uh, of bloggers who have uh, never written about politics or tech uh, who have just started as science bloggers uh, covering science news and uh, you know science basics or science education uh, absolutely wonderfully uh, at uh, you know different reading levels and for different audiences some are targeting more their peers and they may be at a, at a higher level uh, others are targeting really lay audience you know their kids and their grandmothers explaining things in as simple language as possible uh, so they, they span the whole uh, spectrum of uh, of different audiences and different levels of, of difficulty of understanding the material or, or having to have scientific background or not, uh, which is something that mainstream media cannot do. They're kind of tied to one particular level of uh, you know a reading level. I don't know what it is, sixth grade or something like that. Uh, can't go below, can't go above. Right. Uh, so bloggers have the freedom to expand that, and that uh, has. Uh, uh, provided 
for the interested audience, uh, the science you know, information and science news at whichever level they are ready for, and uh, not just the, that one level that the traditional media can provide for, which is uh, absolutely wonderful. So in '05, I was capable of reading uh, every single English uh, language science blog in the world. Uh, right now, I'm probably aware of uh, five percent of them at best, and I try. There's gazillions of wonderful science blogs out there written by a number of interesting people from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of ages, stages of their uh, 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 of their scientific careers, or getting out of science and and uh, as far as doing research, but doing something else, science related, being science education or science journalism, writing books, uh, uh, anything like that. The uh, recently there was a kind of upset at science blogs. Now, science blogs, it, the way you describe it, it kind of makes me think of uh, kind of how iTunes was for podcasting, where suddenly there was a central place for people to find podcasts, and science podcasts and podcasts of all kinds kind of exploded. It was became a, a great way for people to find valuable audio content. Now, uh, science blogs, there was a, the Pepsi scandal, I don't know if you want to call it a scandal or not, but uh, where they they started a blog that was sponsored by a corporation, the corporation being Pepsi, I believe. And uh, th the way that it ended up being put out was that it didn't really, it, it put it forward as being a regular science blog type of blog and not as much of a sponsored blog as it was. And it, it seemed like it was kind of underhanded to a lot of the bloggers on science blogs. And I've noticed since that event, you've moved your blog. You're no longer at science blogs anymore, and you're at your own uh, URL, blog.coternix.org. Um, what kind of, what, what led you to, to leave, to take the exodus? Uh, it was a uh, uh, heart-wrenching ten days of me making that decision. Uh, uh, what 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 happened is that uh, Seed made a, a a tactical mistake. There were uh, sponsored blogs on science blogs before, uh, but they were not paid. Uh, either way, <laughs> nobody paid anybody. And they were hosted by, you know, one of us or somebody independent. Uh, what uh, was different with Pepsi blog is that it was paid by Pepsi. Uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, run and written entirely by employees of the Pepsi company. And it was supposed to be about food. And uh, not everything they make is very healthy food. And uh, so this is what is in journalism known as uh, breaching the wall between uh, advertising and editorial. Uh, and their blog looked exactly just like my blog, for instance. So uh, that would erode the reputation for all of us who, uh, you know, some of us is taking a lot into our reputation for uh, especially people uh, who are uh, 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 who are fighting against uh, uh, medical quackery, for instance, or you know, anti-vaccination movement. They they always get called, you know, pharma shills or some kind of corporate shills, uh, although they are very independent. So this would undermine their argument uh, because there's uh, a corporate blog right next door. Uh, so the first to to notice this really were the medical bloggers and uh, bloggers who are professionally journalists. They, they realized immediately what happened and uh, in their blog post, uh, uh, which they immediately put up, uh, and you know, had to, uh, had, you know, <laughs> heads off to see they always gave us full editorial freedom. So we were always free to criticize them on our blogs and that uh, there was, that was never a problem. So several bloggers wrote uh, why they're leaving or why they're not leaving. Uh, and uh, it is really the, the journalist bloggers that put it uh, most clearly uh, what really happened that made us so unhappy and uh, uh, explained to us why are we feeling so uneasy about this blog because it's uh, something that does have precedent in journalism before uh, advertising posing as editorial content of a, of a magazine or a newspaper. 
And so a number of people left uh, like on the first day. Uh, and then there was kind of a limbo situation. And I was, you know, thinking and, uh, you know, weighing pros and cons. And, uh, you know, after about 10 days, I wrote a long blog post and I left. I decided it's a... Uh, it, the, the, that I would have to go uh, independent uh, and uh, kind of work my, on my own reputation and also work on rebuilding the science blogging ecosystem, the reputation of the, the entire ecosystem. And what happened is uh, something that uh, you know I immediately predicted that a lot of other media organizations are going to uh, uh, jump into the fray building their own uh, science blogging networks because suddenly uh, because of this uh, maybe temporary but at that time very acutely seen uh, loss of reputation by science blogs uh, everybody saw an opening science blogs is now not the only place to look for science online there are other places there are networks on you know uh discover and very soon after that on wired and the guardian and uh, uh, plus and uh, a number of bloggers collectives that built their own uh uh the, their own networks uh completely you know just uh pitching in you know a few bucks each to uh, pay for the server and uh, not having any advertising whatsoever like Santopia and Field of Science and Lab Spaces mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Science 3.0 uh, so there there uh, uh, there's a growing number of networks uh, so it became a, 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 a kind of a often repeated sentiment on like, for instance on Twitter how am I going to keep up with all these bloggers they are moving everywhere some are going <laughs> independent joining other networks the networks are springing up every day uh, how is one to uh, to follow everybody so uh, Anton Zeicher uh, Dave Munger and myself uh, put together a website a simple website which is an aggregator of aggregators uh, it's a uh, scienceblogging.org and we just uh, imported feeds from all the networks and uh, some you know kind of uh, collections of independent bloggers some uh, science news sites uh, put them all together uh, a couple of other people joined us since and uh, so we are uh, now uh, trying to make a more sophisticated website kind of a 2.0 version that we hope to unveil uh, at science online 2011 uh, which will have some more capabilities of uh, uh, tagging and browsing and searching and uh, uh, kind of individualizing uh, one's experience uh, for for the users to be able to use the site the way uh, it fits their interests and their needs. Uh, so that that kind of helped. Uh, and then you know soon after I left uh, science blogs and I was uh, briefly initially involved in in helping with the uh, setting up the PLOS blog network and the Centopia blog network. Uh, I was uh, approached by Scientific American, and uh, after you know a couple of weeks of negotiations, I uh, signed up to uh, develop and uh, launch and then run a science blogging network uh, under the banner of Scientific American. Uh, that will take you know a couple of months to launch, but uh, I'm very excited. Uh, I was just uh, at the New York offices last three days, uh, kind of putting the first. Uh, uh, kind of uh, foundation stones on the whole edifice. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's an ex exciting time for me personally. It's a, a uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to uh, start from scratch and uh, kind of uh, uh, take my vision and turn it into reality. And it's it's a wonderful people to work with and uh, a great brand to work under. So uh, it's going to be exciting for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, what makes what will make a great blog network? I mean, coming from uh, starting with science blogs and working with them and seeing how they worked, and now starting to work as the uh, the chief editor of the Scientific American blogs. Do you have any ideas of what would make a really great network? Uh. I'm not supposed to tell you yet. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Try and get it out of you. <laughs> uh, 
No. Uh, but uh, uh, the thing is, every network is uh, is going to be different, and, and those existing networks are all different, and they have different concepts. They have different people on there. They have different target audiences, different goals, and I think that's wonderful. We, we shouldn't have, you know, uh, fifty networks that are carbon copies of each other. I think uh, uh, what has emerged after the Pepsi Gate is that all these networks should not be seeing each other so much as competition as uh, uh, collaborators. We can work together because uh, science uh, in the media gets uh, such a, a small amount of coverage that we need to work together to uh, push and promote and popularize science and to educate people about science. And we are in the same business and we uh, can help each other. We can drive each other's traffic. It's best, best for all of us. Uh, so, uh, this is a, a kind of a new way of uh, a feeling and thinking. Everybody is feeling very benevolently about everybody else. Uh, there's a lot of uh, crosstalk between uh, different networks. I mean, a lot of uh, uh, people who are in uh, sansblogs.com uh, refugees have landed on, on a variety of different networks and they are still friends. They still talk to each other, they still read each other, they still link to each other, uh, they still kind of influence their own new neighbors in, in that direction. So I see a, a much more uh, intertwined network of networks than it was before. They're not going to be, uh, they already are not as isolated from each other. They don't see each other as, you know, deadly competition. We are in the same business. Let's help each other uh, do uh, uh, you know, what we do. And uh, each network is going to have its own niche, its own part, playing its own part in that, uh, in that ecosystem. So, you know, different networks are going to be strong at one thing and uh, they'll, uh, as Jeff Jarry said, do what you do best and link to the rest. And so each of the networks has something that it does best. And uh, why not link to the others who do something else best? Right. Make everyone, make everyone, lift everyone up. The uh, rising exactly. tide lifts exactly. all ships. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> And, so, and we take over the media like this. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, just a sea change in the way that science is treated in the media, and a whole new push for a different kind of science media. I hope so. <laughs> we need it. A lot of uh, important issues of our times that uh, affect, uh, for instance, our policy um, are uh, very much uh, reliant on understanding the, the, the science that goes into it, you know, global warming, for instance. Very much so. And then many other topics that you brought up um, earlier in the show. Um, there were... You ta started. We started talking the, this, this hour about the science online conference. We're starting to come to the end of the hour, so um, I'm just wondering if people are interested in the science online conference, finding out more about it. Um, where can they go? Uh, the website is uh, scienceonline2011.com. Uh, so it's all one word, and then .com. Science online. 20, science online 2011 uh, and when you go there there there's a, a several buttons that you can click there is a blog and uh, there is a wiki which is the organizing wiki where everybody can edit uh, all the pages as we uh, uh oh not available that's not a good sign <laughs> uh, uh, it was available a minute ago when I last checked anyway uh, you, you can uh, check later. We'll, we'll we'll check on the server. Uh, where, for instance, we have a, a there's already a lot of information on there, but there is a a page called Program Suggestions, where people are just by editing that page, adding, uh, usually volunteering to lead a session on a particular topic, and then after you know a while, uh, it is going to. Uh, crystallize into the actual program uh, and then we'll probably lock that page and uh, or, and I'll be the only one administering it uh, so uh, that uh, we have a program in place by January uh, and the sessions themselves are unconferency in the sense that you know the the way Dave Weiner said it originally uh, the the 
some knowledge and wisdom of people in the room is always greater than the knowledge and wisdom of the person on the stage. So the person on the stage is really a moderator, not a speaker. You know, a five minute, 10 minute introduction just to set the uh, kind of the topic and the theme and the goal of the session. And then it's a discussion. And then discussion afterwards uh, you know, spills into uh, the hallways and the you know, dinner afterwards. Uh, and uh, often results in, in some uh, action, you know, starting a new organization, starting a new website or, or doing something together, a collaboration. Uh, often these sessions don't end uh, when the time runs out. Yeah, I know leaving the conference last year, I felt really inspired and I'd met a lot of people who I'd only previously met on online or only knew them by their online handles. And uh, so it was really an amazing time to be able to get together and meet fate to face to face, have discussions in real time, um, you know, in, in person. And it, it, I think it did lead to a lot of collaborations and a lot of, um, a lot of neat new ideas came out of it. So uh, I hope that the same thing happens for this year's conference, Science Online 2011, which because of the timing, I don't think I'm going to be able to go this year. So unfortunately, I understand. <laughs> unfortunately, there's a certain point that they stop letting you get on planes when you're pregnant. So <laughs> I know. But you'll be able to watch us online. <laughs> so I will try to, you know, live stream everything and you know, uh, Twitter is going to be uh, a, a big deal like uh, last time. I think last last year we had something like 8,000 tweets in a day and a half. Uh, so uh, there's plenty of ways to get informed in real time what is happening on there. But then you'll be back two years from now. Absolutely. Ready to go, better than ever. <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's right. Um, and your blog, yeah, your blog, I'd love to be able to, uh, so your blog is at blog.coturnix.org. Um, That's all right. right. For, for now, until there's a Scientific American network, and then I'll be there. And then you'll be at Scientific American. So you're staying independent for the, sh sh the short term, not for the uh, long yes. term. Yes. Yes, which is why I'm not putting a lot of effort into making my blog being uh, looking very beautiful. <laughs> that, that will come, uh, uh, come with, uh, you know, wonderful artists and designers and Scientific American with all their, you know, 165 years of expertise in doing that. <laughs> so, uh, so my blog is just a, just a simple WordPress blog that has all my archives ready and I can, you know, update my readers on all sorts of stuff. And Twitter, you Twitter, you're on Twitter as well, right? Uh, yes, uh, at uh, Boraz, B-O-R-A-Z. Oops, let me get the right. Or, or, you, or you can just go to my, I have a homepage, coternix.org, which has links to all, you know, everywhere I am online, my, my blog and Twitter and friend feed and Facebook and everywhere else that you can find, you know, Nature Network and YouTube. So, you you know, you can friend me where you want to. Uh, and uh, also link to, uh, you know, scienceinthetriangle.org. Uh, this is a local science blog uh, that I contribute to, uh, which is... Uh, you know, everything here in the triangle that has to do with science is kind of intertwined. It's often the same people involved. There's a uh, SCONC, which is uh, Science Communicators of North Carolina, kind of a loose organization of writers who often write for Charlotte Observer and News and Observer Monday Science Section. They also write for a Science in the Triangle or blog. They all show up at Science Online or a conference and often lead sessions. Uh, many of them are bloggers. Almost every network actually has at least one blogger from North Carolina, which is uh, uh, interesting. North Carolina is full of good science bloggers uh, due to this whole, you know, long tradition of blogging and a long tradition in science. Uh, so that's uh, that's not surprising. And then you know, the scienceblogging.org, the website, look, you know. Uh, found here, uh, researchblogging.org, which uh, compiles uh, blog posts that are specifically covering uh, peer-reviewed literature uh, that was uh, founded in, uh, by Dave Munger at Davidson uh, near Charlotte. 
and Open Laboratory, which is an anthology of the best writing on science blogs that uh, usually comes out every year just in time for science online conference and sometimes a couple of days later, depends on the depends on the year. So those are all kind of uh, bits and pieces of a, a, a larger framework of science communication in the area which spills to the global audience. That's fabulous. It seems like there's just a wealth of information out there. It just takes a little bit of interest and a little bit of time for people to dig into it and then hopefully they'll get hooked. I hope so. It's fun. It's great fun. Reading science blogs is great fun. I do that all day long. <laughs> I would, I would hope that you do with your, with your profession. <laughs> the way your career is going, I hope you pay attention to the blogs. <laughs> I sort of do. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Bora. It's been great talking with you today, and I, you know, I hope this. I know for a fact that uh, people are going to be digging into Science Online 2011, and that it's going to be a great conference again this year. Um, wish you all the luck in getting all of all of the details organized and settled for, for this year's location and everything that, all the details that go into creating a conference. So good luck with that, you and Anton. Um, and with your blogs and with Scientific American, I hope that your visions do become a reality there. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for having me here and uh, great to see you on screen and uh, sooner or later we'll, we'll meet again in person. You know, have a baby first. Yeah, yeah it'll happen. <laughs> I'll get this little thing out of the way and then, you know, be back on a plane in no time. No. <laughs> All right, everybody. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki and you can subscribe to this program by visiting twit.tv forward slash Kiki, K-I-K-I. Uh, you can find videos of it there. You can uh, video, audio, all sorts of different qualities depending on your bandwidth abilities. We, we, we aim to please here at Twit. Additionally, you can find me online as Dr. Kiki. I'm Dr. Kiki on Twitter, and I have a Facebook fan page for Dr. Kiki. You can Google Dr. Kiki. You'll find all sorts of stuff out there. It's pretty simple. Next week, we are going to be talking about the pain that the fishes feel. It's really true. A new book out by Dr. Victoria Braithwaite. We're going to be speaking with her next week about uh, the pain, pain and fish. Could be a really interesting conversation. Lots of people out there, I'm sure you don't think about how much pain those fish go through when they have a hook in their lip. Probably don't. But anyway, we'll be talking about it. So I hope that you will join us again next week. Thanks for joining us this week. And if anything else, if nothing else, I hope this hour made your world a whole lot more interesting. Thanks for watching.